Um, Megan, thank you so much. Could you confirm if you can see my slides and hear me clearly? <clears throat> Great. So uh, it's an honor and thank you uh, to Carla and you and Dr. Wright for organizing this and inviting me to speak. Uh, I'll start off by saying that, you know, I've really changed my slides from the abstract that was submitted for two reasons. Firstly, my, my presentation was switched from day one, which is more the, the technology side. Secondly, I, I was inspired by the talks on social justice that were given yesterday. Uh, and so you will hear something that is very different to the abstract, uh, but I hope it is still re relevant here. Okay. Because the title of my slide has the word environmental biodynamics, I, I, I do want to be fair and just briefly introduce that concept. The concept can be summarized very briefly in just one sentence. Complex systems cannot interact directly or exist in isolation. Um, I must acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Paul Curzon, who, who has been a, a major contributor to this theory and it's been published recently. All this theory says is that the G by E construct of health and disease cannot be fully realized. It is incomplete if we don't consider the role of time. Or in other words, time serves as the interface between how genes and environment interact. And that's all I'll say here about environmental biodynamics. What I want to do today is introduce very briefly, and that's the boring part of this talk, <clears throat> some very uh, basic technology on how to measure time when we study the environment. And then I want to move on to showing how we can use these tools to study uh, environmental health disparities. So very quickly, some of the technology and why we are developing this. An often ignored aspect of environmental injustice is that it actually can start before you are born. And by that, I mean exposure during the prenatal period. And this has always been very hard to study because you cannot directly go and sample a fetus, especially in large epidemiologic studies. So what do we garner then from what is available to us through maternal biomarkers? Well, there's a problem again as well, because the placenta partitions what is transferred to the fetus. I always give this example that if you're studying lead, yes, the mother's blood lead reflects fetal exposure because lead crosses the placenta readily. But other compounds such as cadmium are largely blocked. By, by the placenta, and some are actually actively transported. For example, manganese, which is an essential element, but because we have low tolerance for it or very tight tolerance ranges, it can become neurotoxic. So how do we go back in time, get access to fetal information, but not just one cumulative measure or one snapshot measure as you would get from umbilical cord blood, but rather, we construct fine scale temporal exposure going as far back in pregnancy as possible. Without going into too much of the lab details, I'll just describe the basic idea here. And it's a very simple one. We can analyze growth rings in biological tissues, just like we look at growth rings in trees. We can count back the trees to get a sense of time. And we can look at the structure of, of what the chemical composition is in those rings to get a sense of what has happened in the past. For example, if you see a, a ring that is very thin, that means the, the growth of the tree was stunted and something must have happened, maybe a drought or, or something else. The interesting fact for us here as, uh, as a lab that develops biomarkers is that we have similar growth rings in teeth that are linked to the circadian rhythm. So every day, all of us form a growth ring in our teeth because teeth are made up of this this very highly reactive substance known as hydroxyapatite, we captured many, many chemicals. In fact, thousands of signatures can be found in teeth. The other interesting fact about baby teeth is that they start mineralizing towards the end of the second trimester, beginning of the second trimester. And so every time a child sheds 20 baby teeth, as most children do, they're actually handing you a piece of fetal tissue. And we use that property of teeth to achieve data like this. This is just one example of, of a tooth that was analyzed from a child who was about 10 years old. And on the vertical axis, you have the concentration of lead in the tooth or the intensity of exposure that we are trying to estimate from this. On the x-axis, 
you have this fine scale temporal resolution, which is, which is uh, obtained by mapping along those growth rates. So imagine you did a blood test on this child somewhere in the first year of life, around day 200. You would assume that they haven't had much lead exposure, but if you use the tooth biomarker and go back in time, you will start seeing that there are periods of high exposure. So certainly we can get to that uh, window into fetal exposure by using the tooth biomarker. I've explained all this mainly because I want to show you how we are applying this into studies of environmental justice. But as I said, I was inspired by the talks yesterday and I'll be presenting these, story, the, these studies more as a very general story. And before I do that, uh, before I forget, I want to acknowledge that there are many other technologies out there that are being um, uh, used by, by my colleagues. Uh, for example, the bone biomarkers, the silicon wristbands, and um, uh, the satellite uh, biomonitoring or remote sensing. So I want to share with you a, a story of environmental justice. I just want to tell you that as I was writing this story, I realized that this story is not a, has no surprise ending. It is not a story that you would not have heard many, many times. And it, it's unfortunately a story that you will continue to hear. So while I'll present some data, I want you to really focus on the people behind this story. These stories are published under the banner of the Tooth Fairy Studies, and they're led by what I like to describe is the heroine of this study, Dr. Jill Johnston at the University of Southern California. She's one of my favorite collaborators, and this story is not, dead, or, or not just led by her, but by many of her community activist collaborators, but she's my primary collaborator on, on this work. And the villain of the story is this uh, corporation. It's known as Exide. And what does Exide do? It is one of the world's largest recyclers of these batteries, these spent lead acid batteries. And this is an example of one of their plants. And when you look at a plant like this, you must think this is in a very industrial and very contained facility. But as I say that, you have probably guessed that it's not. In fact, it's in a very suburban area. Now, this is the Exide factory here in the middle, and all you see around here in the gray are the homes that are part of the study that Dr. Jill Johnston and her colleagues are leading. L looking at this ma map, you might not get a sense of, of distance. So let me make that clear for you. This red line represents just one mile. In fact, if you look at this dashed circle, that's 1.7 miles in radius. And that 1.7 miles of radius Tens of thousands of people live there. They're mostly from a poor community, mostly from minority communities, who many of them used to work for, for this factory. So as part of this study, Dr. Johnston and her colleagues measured soil lead levels. And you can see here on, 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 at the bottom of the graph, the various concentrations going from low levels at 80 ppm to over 500. And here's where the, the story starts to, to show its first problems. That in fact, the current regulation in the, uh, by government standards will allow even this orange of 400 ppm to be considered acceptable, right? Later I'll show you data of how it is not acceptable at all, but often it is the lack of this adequate policy and regulation that allows industry to do what, what it often has done. So what did we do in this study? How did we use our tooth biomarker technology to help in this, this story of social injustice? So again, this is that Exide battery smelter plant. Within a one mile radius, we have a 1.7 mile radius, we have all these homes. And this is a very small study, just done from some pilot funding. <clears throat> we collected teeth from children living in 50 different households. So a very small sample of just 50 teeth. And then we started analyzing those teeth by at week by week resolution. And I'm gonna show you some very summary results. Very simple results. All we're comparing is the lead levels in teeth versus the lead levels in soil. On the vertical axis, we have the tooth data and on the horizontal axis, the soil data. And this should come as no surprise. However, there is a big issue of environmental injustice here. It's not that children are being exposed to lead. 
it's more these dark blue, dark blue triangles that I'm representing here. That's the prenatal level. And like I said earlier in my talk, often we forget that environmental injustice actually starts in these communities before you're born. And because the way lead accumulates in our bodies and the way it's transferred across the placenta, passively, as I mentioned before, there's a generational transfer of this injustice. Not only are we transferring socioeconomic injustice, we are transferring this toxic chemical injustice from one generation to the next. Now, let me present some results. After all, this is a research symposium, so let's get into some hardware. This is a very busy uh, slide. All it's showing is some very simple models of prenatal and postnatal tooth concentrations with different measures of, of patient uh, participant characteristics. So again, I've already presented what's in the red uh, rectangle below that soil lead levels are linked to tooth lead levels, both in the prenatal period and the postnatal period. But there's, there is some good news, if, if, if you wish to be optimistic, that if the mother has education, at least high school education, then we see a clear drop in lead levels in the children's teeth. And, and the next comment I think will only make sense to, to those who are, who are American. And I like to say tongue in cheek that that's why there are certain members of our society who are trying so hard to get their children into the school that is very close to this Excite battery plant, which is uh, the University of Southern California. And, and frankly, you know, the popularity of Aunt Becky in American culture, I'm sure most of the country will, will forgive her very soon. But the European colleagues, please ignore that feeble attempt at humor. When it comes to social issues of social injustice, as an academic, it's very nice to look at those graphs, but to be honest, in communities that are so impoverished that do not have education, uh, access to education, often those results are very hard to understand and they're almost meaningless. So again, here, I want to give credit to Dr. Jill Johnston, who's one of those researchers who puts a lot of effort in communicating these complex results back to the community. What I'm showing you is one part of a more detailed infographic that she developed and this conveys in very simple terms how the technology works and what the results mean at an individual level. Um, and this is translated into Spanish as well because many of the uh, members of that community are, are Spanish speaking. So what's happening with the Exide battery plant? Let me give you another piece of information which surprised me, there have been hundreds of citations by government to shut down this plant. And finally, there was such a groundswell, mostly from community activism, that the plant was shut down. But then there was also this call for uh, you know, reparations, for damages to be paid. And again, as I said, there are no twists and turns in this story. This story is something that repeats itself, unfortunately, many, many times. So while we were all dealing with the pandemic and most of the news was uh, covering the pandemic, this is what's happened at the Excide, at to the Excide story. A federal court has allowed Excide to say, well, you can declare bankruptcy and you are no longer responsible for all that has been happening here. And they have just left this, uh, this site and they have moved on. And again, I don't want this talk to be too US centric. And I, I suppose having worked in Europe and in Australia and other countries, sometimes you look at this news and think, this is a very typical American story. But let me tell you something that will change your mind. This is not a typical American story. Excite is a global company. And this is from Excite website taken just today, at least around an, an hour ago. Excite is active in many, many European countries and in Australia and in India. And it has a very sad track record of safety uh, for the communities that where it is based. And in fact, in the US, you might think Excite has shut down, but what's happened is that it sold most of its asset to another company called Atlas, which is now dealing with and doing things that are the there is some concern in the community. Okay, 
as I said at the beginning of, of my talk, that this story is something that you have heard many times and you will continue to hear. So I'm going to very briefly share another story of environmental injustice. And this is just three slides. And after that, I, I will stop. This is a story that, that circles around uh, the city of Detroit uh, and, and Flint, which are in the state of Michigan in the United States. And again, we have a heroine of this study, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, with whom I collaborate. For those of you who are not familiar with this story, it starts off very simply that most of Detroit and the, and the surrounding areas, uh, or, or actually Flint and the surrounding areas, get their water from Lake Heron. In 2014, this water supply is switched to the Detroit River. Now, let me walk you through what that switch actually did and what it looks like. Now, you might think that if the water coming out of your taps turns slightly grayish or slightly yellowish, somebody would take notice. This was a paper published in one of the American Chemical Society journals, and what you will see are actual samples of the Flint water supply going from what is supposed to be clear water or clean water from a different source going further, higher and higher. And you look at the pipes that were being used to pump this new source of water, you will see the pipes are in this condition and very highly lead contaminated or lead containing pipes. This started on, on April 25th, 2014. So they switch uh, to the Flint River um, and, and from the Heron uh, Lake, and that's the start of the crisis. There are many timelines and twists and turns to this story. And actually in Wikipedia, it's constantly updated. So if you don't want to read a full journal article about this, just go to the Wikipedia site of the Flint water crisis, and you will see a very nicely detailed timeline. But what stood out for me in this timeline is, in October that year, the General Motors plant in Flint said, you know, the water since the switch has become so bad that it is corroding our engine parts. So they petitioned the government and they were allowed to switch back to the clean water source. Over a, a year later, it took more than a year, a year and a half actually, for the mayor of the city to declare a state of public health emergency. And some residents still are living off bottled water. But that's the background of the story. How is our technology or how the tooth biomarker is helping in this story? And I want to be very clear that these are preliminary results, they're not peer reviewed. So please, you know, I, I want to exercise, for you to exercise some caution in, 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 in interpreting these results. What we're showing here again is the tooth lead levels at week by week uh, resolution. So on the vertical axis, you have the lead concentration and on the horizontal axis, you have time. Anything left on the dashed vertical red line is the prenatal period, and everything uh, on, on the right side is postnatal period. This is data from one subject. I'm sorry, the, 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 the dashed red line is, is not the prenatal, sorry. It's zero, anything left of zero is prenatal. The dashed red line is the switch in the water supply. So as you can see, prenatally and early postnatally, as the lead levels uh, are, are, are being tracked in the tooth biomarker, soon after the switch in water supply, we start seeing that the lead levels are rising. We've analyzed many teeth and we are going to analyze hundreds more, but this is not a unique data set. We see this again, and please pardon my error, the postnatal should be uh, around the zero line. The red, again, the, the, the dashed, red line represents the switch in water supply, not, not the birth. The birth is represented by zero. That, that's, an, that's a typo on my part. So as we see the lead levels prenatally and before the switch in water supply, they are low and then they start switching rapidly. So we are seeing very clear data that that switch in water supply actually resulted in a transfer of lead to the children. And Again, this is not something that should be surprising. What we're doing next is looking at those children who were still uh, where the mothers were pregnant when the water switch happened. And to, to see whether we can look at the transfer of lead to the prenatal period. 
I want to start off by, uh, by recognizing that this is, I want to end, sorry, by recognizing that this is an issue of as much of racial injustice because most of the communities that I have discussed are brown and black communities in the US who are bearing the brunt of this environmental injustice. So this is as much an issue of racism as it is of economic injustice, of government policy failures and of industry misbehavior. Now, uh, again, I want to end by thanking uh, Dr. Jill Johnston who leads the study, uh, the Truth Fairy study at USC and Dr. Ma Mona Hanna-Atisha who's leading the study um, at, uh, for the Flint water crisis in Michigan. I also want to thank the NIEHS for allowing me to do all of this work, um, uh, which, which I hope will have an impact on the community. I will stop there and, and I look forward to, to any questions or comments uh, that you may have.